Genesis chapter 35. Tonight we're getting to change a little bit as we get into the next couple of chapters, the end of basically the story of Jacob because it turns now to his children and then more specifically to Joseph. But there's two themes that we're going to see that are going to run through chapter 35. Uh, completion and correction. These are things that we're going to see. In, uh, it's a story of completion because Jacob is back in the land of promise. He's been gone for 20 years. And now he's back with his family and all his wealth. You might say the victory's won. The goal's been achieved. The promise has been fulfilled. God said he'd bring him back. Here he is. But it's also a story of correction because the family had not completely begun to walk in faith yet. There were idols that had to be put away, had to be buried, and Reuben is going to have to be dealt with. So in verse 1 of chapter 35, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. You know, the first 15 verses of uh, chapter 35 record Jacob's return to Bethel, house of God. That's where he's heading. It's about uh, 15 miles south of Shechem, and he has to complete the vows he's made. He hasn't done that yet. Those vows that he made earlier in Bethel when he was fleeing from Esau, including making Yahweh his God, making Bethel God's house and pledging a tithe to God. He's pledged these things. And so God calls Jacob to return to the land, but his pilgrimage did take a long time. But we have to remember our time is not God's time. Things happen in His time. We get impatient, but we shouldn't. And He's been gone for a while. And the trip back wasn't an easy trip. Not only physically, but emotionally too. I'm sure He's thinking all the time as we talked about. But now, back in the land, trouble has uh, you know, exposed itself there at Shechem. And, well, Things haven't been quite as smooth as maybe he had hoped. But God had to remind Jacob of his forgotten vows. We all need to be reminded of time from time to time of what we promised the Lord. Because he keeps his word, he keeps his promises. You know, what he says he is going to do, he has done. What we promise to do, what we're supposed to do, we may not always do. That's why I've said many times, that's why the Lord has to take us out to the woodshed every now and then as we get off of the path. Apparently, <clears throat> his indifference to those vows provided the occasion for the defilement of his daughter there at Shechem. <clears throat> you know, it's so easy to get in trouble when you begin to just slide back into the world and forget what the Lord has told you to do. And we try to do things on our own. We try to make our own plans and we don't always go to the Lord and ask Him what we should do. You notice Jacob, after he met his brother, he didn't ask the Lord, should I go on down to my father's house with him? I'm just going to go the other direction. Well, he probably should have traveled to Beersheba, his parents' home, without bothering to stop at Shechem because what happened? He got in trouble. Not necessarily he himself, but because of his leadership and his, you know, the responsibility is there, there's trouble. So in verse 2 and following, it says, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us rise, and go up to Bethel, and I will make thee an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all the earrings which they wore in their ears. And Jacob hid them under an oak, which was by Shechem. 
and they journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Well, the first thing they need to do for him to complete those vows, those promises he had made, they need a little sanctification. They have to be set aside. There's something that has to be done here. And, and we see a major problem. The family had to remove all those idols, those strange gods. You know, you may when you read over that, you might miss it. It's very important. They're still carrying these gods with them. There was still a strong influence of paganism that they brought from Laban in that area. They're still holding on to these things. And that's a major problem. It's always a major problem in this idol worship. Now those false gods must be put away. They have to be put away in the family of Jacob. They have to be put away in our life too. Because God permits no rivals. He allows only single loyalty. He doesn't allow magical charms. You know, one of the things that I always... I know a lot of times it's just habit of speech, but a Christian says, well, I sure was lucky today. No, you weren't. I was lucky that car didn't hit me. You weren't lucky. There's no luck with God. There's no magic. You, know, you don't rub a crystal ball with God. You don't carry a rabbit's foot, all those things. God's in control. It's not luck. Think of God. And you know, I'm sure these people in the family were holding these strange gods with them and they were using them. You know, maybe like some people carry a rabbit's foot or four-leaf clover or whatever. But you know what? They're worthless. They're useless. So they had to get rid of these things. And all this purification, getting rid of those strange gods, those, I don't know if they're little idols, big idols, whether they're made of gold, silver, wood, we don't know. And then washing themselves and changing their clothes. Even the earrings. The earrings must have had something to do with pagan worship. Got rid of those too. But all this was going to be instructive for Israel in the future. They were later going to need such a consecration when they enter into the land of promise. Over in Joshua 5, we'll talk about that. So they buried the idols. That's kind of a, picture, a nice picture, isn't it? They were dead to begin with. Let's bury them. Put them away. The earrings, they were apparently associated with the, some of the idols in some way. Maybe some type of fetish, I don't know. But Jacob had to take all these things and bury them. Put them away. They're out of sight, out of mind. He left those false gods behind in the grave, so to speak. And he heads toward the house of God. Now, people in the surrounding towns, you would think, are looking at them. They know what happened to Shechem. Remember, Jacob is afraid. They're going to pursue us. There's more of them. They're going to kill us. But you notice, even after they heard of the massacre at Shechem, they feared Jacob because of God. God had put that fear in. I'm not talking about respect now. We're talking about knee-knocking fear. God had gave those people a fear. Don't you fool with my people. That's basically what's happened. You see, it wasn't luck that kept those people from attacking Jacob and his people. It's God. There is no luck. Those, and by burying those idols, everything to do with them, the family says, wait a minute, those idols didn't help us either. It's God. And then things are buried away now. So in verse 6, So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Elah Bakoth. So he arrives back at Bethel. It used to be called Luz, L-U-Z. And Jacob built an altar there to God, just as God instructed him to do. God said, go build an altar. So he did. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, Deborah... Rebecca's uh, nurse, Jacob's mother, died. 
The death seems to indicate another stage in this narrative of the patriarchs. It's ending. You notice things are happening. We bury those idols. They're gone. Now we see Deborah dies. We're going to see some other things happening here that are closing the door on this particular portion of Scripture, this um, era of the life, end of the life here. So the naming of the place uh, there was means oak of weeping. And it commemorated the weeping that went on for over the death of the nurse who was buried under an oak tree. Interestingly, Jacob's wives' idols were buried where? Under an oak tree, back in Shechem. Maybe oak trees are you know, well, numerous around there, I don't know, but it's interesting that they were both buried under oak trees. Verse 9, And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And the king shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he had talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon and poured, on, poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. At Bethel, God once again confirmed the promises that he had made earlier. What's he confirming? The Abrahamic covenant. Land seed blessing. Blessing may not be mentioned here, but it's understood. He is just passing the same blessing, the covenant that he gave with Abraham, confirmed it with Isaac. Now he's confirming it again with Jacob, Israel. It goes, you just see it following, and we can follow this promise all the way down. And Jacob's name change here is important too to Israel because remember he's already been said that he'd be called Israel. Now, this is proof of the promised blessing. You're no more Jacob, you're Israel. Well, if we look at his life, though, it's kind of like a chart up, down, up, down. Israel, Jacob, Israel, Jacob. That's what's going to happen. And he's like we are. We have days when our faith is way up, and then some days our faith is way down. He's human. And God's reference to himself here as God Almighty, El Shaddai, was also an assurance that his promise would be fulfilled. In other words, I can do it all. I am all powerful, I'm all seeing, I'm everywhere. I am God Almighty. And if I give you a promise, you can be sure it's going to take place. Those false gods that they carried with them didn't do a thing, did they? They didn't keep any promises. They're now dead and buried. I am the only God you are to worship. I am the only God you are to carry with you. I am God Almighty. That's what he's saying. He's telling Jacob, Israel, that's what he's telling them right now. Now that... Jacob is back in the land of promise. The promise of the nation, that's seed and kings and the land is, is confirmed once again. There is no doubt who the land belongs to. You know the land with the oldest deed in the world is Israel. The world belongs to God. He gave it to Israel a long time ago and it hasn't changed. So Jacob's actions here are almost identical to those in his earlier Bethel experience. He set up a stone pillar. He poured oil on it. He named the place Bethel. And both times, God promised Jacob many descendants in the land. And they're coming. 
But here he added kings would be included also. When we think about the kings, we know the king is coming. The king of kings. And they journeyed from Bethel. And there was but a little way to come to Ephraim. And Rachel travaileth. And she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name ben -Nai. But his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephraim, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Once in the land, the family was completed with the birth of Benjamin. It's interesting, 11 of the 12 sons, 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel were born outside of the promised land. Only Benjamin is born in the land. These are the 12 tribes. The rest were born out. Now, his favorite wife, Rachel, dies in childbirth. Her death was the, we see here, the second transitional death here in chapter 35. She named the son Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob says, that's not going to do for the lad. I'm not naming him that. So he named him Benjamin, which is the, which means son of my right hand. Jacob turned this occasion of sorrow into triumph and victorious prospects. You know his heart is breaking. It's his favorite wife. Now he has another son, but it's got to be hurting. But rather than saying, oh, he is the son of my sorrow. No, he's the son of my right hand. He's going to be close to me. And he wanted to give a good name to the child who would, uh, who was the answer actually to Rachel's prayer for a second son. Remember the name Joseph it comes from the root word in Hebrew that means to add. She was praying to add another son. God answered that prayer. So this section also signifies the fact that Israel, once in the land, would continue to flourish under God's blessing. And as we go through the Bible, when you go through the portions of history especially, you see that when they're following God, God's blessing is there. But when they turn aside, what happens? Trouble. So often when you go into the judges, for example, they're up here, then they start, down, oh Lord, help us, help us, help us. The Lord helps them. They get back up here. They forget about the Lord. Down they go again. It's a repeated cycle. But if they would stay, they're going to be under God's blessing no matter what. But their faith just goes and they try to do things on their own just like everybody else. But they would flourish under God's blessing. But they're going to suffer when they turn aside. So Jacob set up a stone pillar over the grave between Bethel and Bethlehem. Uh, Ephrath is uh, another name for Bethlehem. You read over in Micah 5 2, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Same place. Uh, Rachel weeping for her children. In verse uh, 21, and Israel journeyed. Notice that? And Israel journeyed. What does that tell us right here? Those three words. His faith is up now. He's been to Bethel. He's been with God again, even though he has lost his wife. Notice, Israel journeyed. He has faith right now. He's, he's in an up mood, so to say. He's close to God. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Adar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bela, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. Okay. Here, the account of Isaac is going to draw to a close here also in these next verses. Uh, but we have several other things we have to look at. First, we see Reuben's breach of etiquette. He's really damaging the family here. 
this is basically it's incest, what we have here. Uh, Jacob's concubine and Rachel's servant, by whom he had two sons, Dan and Nephitelli. Here comes Reuben. Reuben is committing a sin here, a really serious one. Reuben's transgression took place at uh, Edar, between Bethlehem and Hebron. It's possible that Reuben here, and I'm just speculating, he's the oldest child, and he was trying to replace his father, maybe a little prematurely here, as the patriarch of the family. I say this because if you study the paganism of the time, that's what would happen. The oldest son would sometimes push the father out of the way to take over. And of course, we see this when you start studying the kings. Now, some kings didn't last long, did they? Somebody's always in the back room plotting to kill them. Everybody wants the power. But whatever the reason, there's no excuse for what he did. But in doing so, he's going to lose his inheritance, his birthright. And we find that over chapter 49. You know, what's interesting here is we find that, you know, we don't have a lot of information about Israel's reaction to his son, but he takes his birthright. So he's angry. He's upset. He seems to be more upset over this than his daughter being raped. Did you notice that? There's a something here. But the act is noted by Jacob, who is called Israel here. He's, I'm sure that he is really trying to turn, staying with the Lord. But you know, there was so much silence with rape of his daughter, and now he's just not, well, he's angry. And we're going to see that it's going to cost Reuben. Now we see by the events that have happened to this point, why the blessing goes not to the first son, nor the second son, nor the third son, but to Judah. Because the first three have eliminated themselves. Verse 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi and Judah, and Ishishar and Zebulon, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Nephetali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher, these are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padan Aram. Now a second report here lists the uh, seven sons who become the heads of the twelve original tribes of Israel. Now, we're going to have a lot of discussions over this as you go through the Bible about the twelve tribes of Israel because some of the names are going to change. There's going to be a blessing on Joseph, but Joseph's not one of the tribes. But his sons are. And then you see Dan is sometimes mentioned. Dan sometimes is not mentioned. So we'll have to wait and discuss each event as we come to it in Scripture. Uh, this is another assurance, though, that the promise of God is good. Twelve sons. Abraham had to wait till he was 100 years old to have one child of blessing. In Isaac, only two sons, the twins. And now God's blessing is really 12 sons. In pretty short order when you think about it. 20 years over there. He hasn't been back in the land long. He has a lot of sons in a very short period of time. So the list provides a first fruits, I guess you might call it. It's one of my favorite terms when things like that happen of the tribes that would become a great nation, the great nation of Israel. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Here's the last death reported in this chapter. Isaac, 180 years old. It's amazing the longevity in those days, isn't it? People say, well, you're, we're living longer than ever. No, we're not. You're going to live until the Lord calls you home. I don't care if it's 
10 or 100, but you're not living longer. Man's longevity did decrease greatly after the flood, but the reason that we don't live as long as they did is because the effects of the curse continue to grow generation after generation. Sin is worse. Diseases are worse. So our lifespan is shorter. Now, modern science would say, boy, is he a dummy. But biblically, we just spoke the truth. And that's the reason things are. Why do you have a virus today? Because of sin. What's God trying to accomplish with it? To bring people to Him. That's what it's all about. You know, this isn't the first plague all around the world. And it won't be the last, I can guarantee, because I've read what happens in tribulation. We won't be here, but God is reaching out to people. And their minds just can't grasp this. How can a merciful God bring this down? Which is better? To come to Jesus Christ now and live forever with Him? Or just enjoy this life and die and go to hell? He's reaching out. And people just stick their spiritual fingers in their ears. Rabbit trail. weren't my notes, I'm sorry. Anyway, Isaac was living near Hebron, a little farther south than Beersheba at this time. And Jacob and Esau unite now to bury their father. Now, we don't have any other record of them meeting in Scripture since his return to the land. It could be the first time that they've met since then. I don't know. They may have had some conversation. They may have met. I don't, you know, we don't know. But they do come together to bury their father. Perhaps this is the first time since that meeting. But in the events of chapter 35, Jacob learned that while his return to Canaan was a completion of a promise, he also uh, could not be complacent in what he's doing. There's a new beginning. You know, every day is a new beginning with the Lord. Isn't it wonderful? But he's starting a new chapter completely. Deborah and Rachel and Isaac all died. It's an end of an era. Things are changing. Now the patriarch is who? Jacob, Israel. He doesn't... Um, he can't go to Grandpa. Abraham's gone. He can't go to Dad. He's gone. He's the head. So Reuben now has relinquished his right to inherit the blessing because sin has to be dealt with. That's the lesson right there. It has to be dealt with. You can't let it go by. Idols have to be buried. They have to be put away. Everyone has to be consecrated in order for Jacob's vow at Bethel to be completed. The nation now is complete with 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of the nation. And during this great transition, faith in God has to be revitalized so that His covenant could be carried forward. Basically what I'm saying, they needed a revival, didn't they? They needed to revive that faith in God that just flickers every now and then. And that's what happens here. So, for this reason, the chapter emphasizes Jacob's vow and God's promises. It's a whole new beginning now for Jacob. Even though his brother is slightly older, he is the one who was chosen. He is the one to carry the blessing. He is Israel. Hang on just a second. Got the same, same notes again. This is like deja vu all over again. Okay. As we get into verse, chapter 36, and I'm not going to go uh, a great deal into reading here, uh, but more just going to try to explain, and I won't get through too much probably tonight, but this chapter is complicated and, it, and it's difficult, and the, well... The details can be baffling. Uh, the story of Isaac that began back in chapter 25, it ended last chapter in 35-29. It's closed. Uh, you know, that, so now he's talking about the succession of sons. That's uh, the custom of wrapping up history. 
of the unchosen line first and then the chosen line. First, you, you see the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Uh, and we see that he took wives. I'm just going to kind of discuss these verses rather than read them, if that's okay. These verses that from 1 to 8 here give us the line of Esau. He had three wives, none of which I'm sure pleased mom and dad. We know that. Two of the wives' names are not the same as listed earlier. Either the others had died and he had remarried, or maybe they had a favorite name that wasn't listed earlier. But anyway, they may have taken two different names. We don't know. But uh, one of his wives is the great granddaughter of Seir, the uh, Horite, whose descendants were living in Edom. Uh, when, uh, when Esau was there. From these three wives, Esau had five sons. And the narrative that stresses two elements. First, Esau's sons were born in the land before he moved to Seir. Now, that contrasts rather sharply, doesn't it, with Jacob and his sons, where his children were born out of the land except for Benjamin, and that was it. Second, it's important that you, in those verses that you should understand that Esau is Edom. This will make much easier for you as you go on in your study, especially as we get into the history of Israel. When it talks about Edom, you'll know that this is the descendant. You know the descendant of Esau. Um, it's a fact that is, you're going to be reminded about all through this chapter. Certainly Israel would understand the importance of this because she struggled so often with the Edomites. And these are Esau's descendants. This is still family. You know, the worst fights, the worst arguments happen between who? Family. And that family is still fighting today. They've been fighting now for years and years. The wording in verse 7, though, is, is kind of striking. One thinks of Lot when I read this. For the riches were more than they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. You see, Esau, like Lot, left for the east. He left for greener pastures. Some things never change. You look out there and he says, wow, that is a much better place. Let's go. Now, what happened to Lot when he chose a better place? Trouble. Again, though, we don't expect to see Esau ask the Lord's advice. We don't see that anywhere in Scripture. And then it goes on a very long section again through verse 19. Uh, it's an account that I think I'm going to wait to get into next week because it's so complicated. So we'll pick up and uh, I may have to read some of this for you because it is a little difficult. We'll stop right there because I'm running out of time.